His name was Slim Brundage, but they called him the janitor. His name was Slim Brundage, but they called him the janitor. His name was Slim Brundage, but they called him the janitor. I need you to put this right next to the speaker. Hello, Steve, how you doing? Steve, can you hear me? Mr. Mr. Steve, can you hear me? Mr. Beasley, can you hear me, sir? Put it right next to the speaker. Hello, hello, Steve. It's been a while. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah, I can hear you. All right. Good, you, uh, good to see you, Tim. Good to see you. I've been meaning to come by your place for a while. Text well, me. I'll be glad to see you if and when. Yeah, I'm for a couple of weeks, but uh, I might be going. Uh, who knows? All right. Uh, okay. All right. We can see Charlie and. All right, I'm just double checking everything. All right, I gotta do a little bit of, gotta get some other things here real quick to get everything going. Okay. All right. And it's spelled. No, no. Be quiet. No, you do not have a right. You do not have a right. You tell you have to learn from who? Learn from who? I have to learn about medicine from who? A boy with his hair. You are not the spokesman for public health. You can, you can. Go ahead. You got an obsession. Well, listen. Margaret told you not to say it. I told you several times. You don't want to listen. Okay. Yeah, Steve, can you hear me? Yep. Can you hear me? I can. I'll be at least ten. Okay, good. All right, we're gonna be starting. Yeah, I'm gonna need a couple of minutes. We're gonna be starting in about five minutes. Sure. I don't know what's going on. John Beasley, are you there? Yeah, he's there. John, can you hear us? All right. Okay. As a matter of fact, you don't know anything about medical. That's another question. I applied for jobs. I hired for the medical You have to go courses that you had in medical science. Can we live here? You are. You can. You okay. are not. Yes, I can hear you fine. Fine. <laughs> good, good, good. Now, can you? So, yes, you, I can see you should be able to hear me, and I can see you guys. So. Yeah, good, good, good. You can Very hear good. Me. All right, Dan and yes. Lana. Kelvin's involved. Good. We're going to get started. Give me about three minutes, guys. We'll get started in the meeting, okay? There's a few of us coming, and we might still have a few more coming. So, uh, all right. Hey, Kel uh, hey. Hello, Kelvin. Hello, Kelvin. How you doing? Hi, Kelvin. Uh, all right. Talk about yourselves a few minutes. I'm going to go grab a quick puff, and we'll get started here in a few. Okay. We're getting there. Good. All right. Okay. So it looks like some of you are in the restaurant and some of you are meeting by Zoom. Hmm. Yep. I'm in Dallas, by the way. I, I, uh, Charlie, Charlie attends our, our one in Dallas, and uh, I, I could only. Say hello. So I said to Charlie, I'd I listen to his talk tonight instead. How many usually show up in Chicago? Uh, 
Hello. Hello. It depends. Maybe between five and fifteen, something like that. Oh, okay. Just about like Dallas, actually, these days. Yeah. yeah. We used to. Um, yeah. yeah, we've had we've had as many as about forty or fifty sometime <laughs> in the old days. Yeah, we in, met the old, in the restaurant. In the old days, in the restaurant, yeah, there were forty or fifty. Yeah, before the pandemic. And then the. Uh, and then the uh, the group the, there's a group of very right wing people who used to come and then so they split off and they had their own meeting. Uh, <laughs> uh, right. So we're we're, we're, we're both we're, we we're really uh, only the more liberal and democrat side of things well, these days. That's sort of debatable. I mean, I wouldn't call it. I'd say there are a few left-wing people, but the, it generally is right-wing, pretty much. Oh, generally right, more right-wing. Yeah. I thought Chicago was, was much more of a, a Democrat city, actually. Yeah, it's a Democratic state, Illinois. State. Like a uh, red state. Well, of course, yeah. I need to alert Anyway, that's good. We'll... Um, but tonight's talk is not is not political, so uh, at least it might. Be. I don't think it's political. But we'll see. Yeah, I said I want to. Oh. It's Jake. Okay. All right, we'll be starting in a second here, everybody, okay? Hi. Hey, Jake, how you doing? All right, Molotov here. All right. Ooh. Look at you guys. Oh, God, Charlie's made it out of his house. Go oh, on, man. I'm just amazed you made it out of your house, Charlie. Yeah, dude. I thought somebody snake nicked your front door, okay? What does nicked mean in England? Stolen. Ah, oh, stolen. Okay. Sorry, English bloke. Presumably, presumably, if you get caught stealing, that's where you got to go to the net. But I mean, you know, this is my files. Why won't you solve the download? I don't know why you want to download it. I got it up on the computer. Yeah, but I want to. You should be able to do it. I'm not sure. All right. Wait a second. Just wait.
he uh, you, you got you got to you got to call up. Yeah. All right, ready to get going? Well, yeah, well, okay. you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna do the intro, so. I'm going to start recording now and I'm going to put you right on and you're going to start off. I'm going to start off with the introduction tonight. So, hey. all right now, hang on. Let me get my, my can. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Start. Okay. Welcome to meeting number 3474 of the College of Complexes. The playground for people who think. Can everybody hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Yes. All right. Let's see. We got uh, two basic rules. Um, no personal tax. Right? You got that down, guys? No personal tax and yeah. one school at a time. Very right. simply. Okay. Could you speak a little directly? Could you speak a little more directly into the microphone? Oh, all right. The format is the presentation followed by question and answers, of period, and then a rebuttal remarks period, and the final end is the speaker's final remarks. So there's four parts to the format. Okay, and now we begin with announcements. Does anybody have an announcement of the community event around town? Oh. Bob Lichtenberg. Okay, Bob, come on up and I'll give your announcement. Is that coming to okay now? Yes. All right, everybody's coming. Go ahead, Bob. If anyone is interested in the um, relevance of the great books and novels, please come to the Porch Park Senior Center Thursday at noon. If you're a senior, you can get a great price meal, very healthy, and um, a lot of club meeting at noon. I want to talk about a great book, a great novel. And I'll have a handout summarizing the main points. It's every Thursday at noon, Port Park Senior Center down on Irving Park and Long between Central. Thank you. Okay. All right. That's Thursday at noon. Yeah. Thank you. Bob. All right. Are there any more community announcements? Okay. okay. Jan, you want to come up here? Tell us about your community feature. Yeah, You're going to have the, is this going to be in conjunction with the NEIS, Jen? It is. I'll get the website up. Oh. Well, uh, it's a long way off. It's the week of Easter in March. We're going to have a uranium film festival. And this is, uh, sp this is sparked, or the people behind it, the energy comes from Rio de Janeiro. A couple of people named um, Marcia and Norbert Suchinek have been doing the Uranium Film Festival for more than 10 years. And for the first time, it's coming to Chicago, being sponsored by the NEIS. And it's named Uranium because Norbert Suchinek found that people were aware of radiation. They didn't understand that it was connected to uranium. And uranium is the source of all unnatural radiation on the earth now. So uh, I just wanted to give you a heads up that the Uranium Film Festival is coming to Chicago in March. Okay. Charlie, you want to go ahead and do the... Uh, Thank you, Dan. I'll get the... Uh... All right. Yeah, just got an announcement. Come on up here. Andy gave us a good talk last week. I'd like to announce something that's pertinent to the talk tonight. There's two books out. Uh, one of them is called The Collapse of Western Civilization by Naomi Oreskes and Eric M. Conway. It's a book that it's fiction based on current science. This was written about three, four years ago, so the science is a little out of date. Global warming and the ice melting in Greenland is happening faster, 100 times faster than what they thought two years ago. But this is looking back from 300 years from now. 
when the sea levels rose 60 feet in 19, uh, 2087 and wiped out all the coastal cities on the planet. This other book is called Facing the Climate Emergency, How to Transform Yourself with Climate Truth. It's written by Margaret Klein Salmon and Molly Gage, Facing the Climate Emergency. It's a small book, affordable, talking about what ordinary people can do to make a difference. So uh, I highly recommend uh, these two books especially, and uh, they'll fit right in with uh, Charlie's talk on on the on climate. I'm assuming. So thank you so much. Okay. Uh, All right, is that you want to bring up the PowerPoint presentation, please? What about? Mr. I Technician. thought you were going to go. Um, I thought you were going to go over the uh, announcements. Well, we'll upcoming. skip it because it's coming up in a. We're gonna we're gonna be there'll be no meetings on December 23rd and 30th in, in conjunction with the holiday. So everybody have a happy holiday from the faculty and students of the College of Complexes. Okay. Well, let's get in. Let's just do the program. Okay. Let me, uh, a long way off. let me get in there and uh, get the presentation up, and we'll be starting in just a Here's second. My... Bear with me, Charlie. I just got to make sure that... Uh, so give me a second to get the screen up. Okay. All right, go to, go to share screen here. What about the clicker? It's not working. I, you, I, you'll advance for me? What? You're going to have to advance then. I know that. That's, okay. that's correct. I will advance. I'm going to go to full screen here. Okay. And we're ready to go, Charlie. All right, welcome everyone. This is going to be a five part presentation. The first part uh, is a general introduction of what the issue is, defining the terms. Uh, as I say at the University of Chicago, define your terms. Uh, the next three sections are the three steps. And I am recommending that we, the residents of the planet undertake to save the planet. And the last part is an assorted number of topics uh, to bring it up at the end. Okay, we see at the beginning a simple three-step process to terraform the Earth into a, a habitable planet. Next slide. Oh. All right, uh, and why must something be done? Next. Now where I began with this, geological time is divided up into epochs. There's also periods and ages and extinction, things like that. But there's uh, epics, and we are in the uh, Anthropocene epic. And I was looking like, what actually took place to, to travel from one epic to another? And that was the basic thing that I was looking at, what happened to the Earth. At one time, there was an epic in which the Earth was, was largely inhabited by lizards, and ferns, and then it was replaced with one by um, mammals and flowering plants. And I said, maybe we should undertake the same thing and do that. Another thing about terraforming, there's been some talk over the years. We had them near the Mars Society, forming Mars and making, so it's making it possible to colonize the planet. It presently does not have any atmosphere. And through a process of terraforming, they would make it uh, available for, for uh, that's still in the news. Okay, next one. Now, unless we do something, um, the, um, let, me, let me advance mine a little bit. Um, now, if we do absolutely nothing, there's all kinds of dates that are given, but if we do absolutely nothing, that is what the Earth is going to look like, big red ball. Um, but the change, the epic I say began uh, probably in the, um, <laughs> the 18th century with the Industrial Revolution and the extensive use of fossil fuels. Uh, for manufacturing processes. So that's where we're at, and that's what precipitated, is going to precipitate a new epic taking place. Now, we 
can control what happens. In the past, it was basically up to nature, but we are, we are far, far beyond that. And simply by doing what I recommend, we can control what happens with the planet. Okay. Now, why do we have to do anything? Uh, next slide, Charlie. Yes, next. It's because problems persist with the production of greenhouse gases, primarily carbon dioxide and methane. Uh, carbon dioxide, you see, is about 80 some percent of our current atmosphere um, with about 10% methane. Methane is a particularly nefarious gas. Uh, uh, carbon dioxide dissipates relatively quickly in various means, but methane seems to hang around for 10 years. So that's the, one of the big problems on the uh, edge. Another thing is uh, global fresh water demand will outstrip supply by 40%. Next I believe slide. Dan more Weinberg uh, spoke next slide. Uh, spoke about that here at the college. Okay, the next one with the automobile, sir. I got it. Okay, now what is the difference between my plan and the others? Is that everybody else is trying to institute control or containment measures. Don't do this, don't do that, don't drill for oil, only drive, only use a bicycle, don't have a car, uh, don't use plastic, uh, don't use plastic bottles. Everyone's setting law, law rule or regulation. However, no one, we simply can, the parties in worldwide, uh, there's no mutually agreed upon coercion. With my plan, there is no coercion. It's just something we do. And we don't need someone's concurrence. We're not instructing somebody to adjust their behavior or to terminate doing A, B, or C. That's why the difference of this is, it's a positive activity, which most people would certainly, or, or political entities, deciding officials would normally engage in. Next slide. Tim? I got it. Okay. Uh, just to tell you, show you another feature of where we're at right now. This is a, a, a list of the taken from the uh, the 15 top multinational global companies. And you can see each of them is heavily based on fossil use for production or sale and purchase for, uh, of them. So th that's what I mean. Our economy still is largely tied to the fossil fuel sector. Next, we and also, of course, as we all know, there's continued reliance on oil, uh, pressure for more drilling sites such as offshore, and there are always the battles continuing, still going on regarding pipelines across our nation. So that next slide. Next, another thing that's a little bit different about the situation now is that for 90 percent of the history of Mankind, humans were engaged in, uh, uh, were hunter gatherers. The situation is just the reverse today. They're virtually, they're only 2% of the people identify themselves occupationally as being farmers. I don't think any of us is fully qualified to be a, a hunter gatherer. So the situation has changed. We're reliant upon systems that are providing us. Now, what do we call the system that we rely on? The fancy term would be tillage, or the technical term would be intensification. Intensification is what you see when you grow food, in essence, farming. Next slide. Uh, why do we have to do something about that? Now, we're not, here's another thing. We're already, now we're going to be confronted, we'll see this later in another slide, by challenges to the growing of, of food. And we already are facing food insecurity as it is without the onset of climate change. We already, there is incident of uh, hunger by state. You can see it's not too bad. Texas, you guys got to get a little better. 
Now, what is going to happen? Why is food important? Because it's going to be affected. Agricultural productivity is going to be affected in four different ways. Increase in temperature. There's going to be changes in uh, participation patterns. Uh, extreme weather events. And four, reductions in water availability. Each of these may result in a diminished food supply. So what I'm telling you about is not just a good idea. Next one, sir. Food also is at, I mean, the UN Association food is at the core of the sustainable development goals. Um, the goal for many years was just to buy one cup of food per day for everyone on earth, and they were not succeeding in that regard. Um, whoops. Okay, next one. Which one? You want the With the woman in the cabinet. Incidence of food security is increasing. Um, according to Feeding America, one in seven people struggles with food hunger. And next slide. What can we do to mitigate the situation? I know you are all asking yourself, right? Yes. What can we do? What can we do? And I'm going to help you out because I'm the nice guy that I am. But seriously, how do we get clean air, water, and have an adequate food supply? I can tell you how. Next slide. Answer. Foster the spread or set in motion ecosystems worldwide that have proven benefits. Set in motion ecosystems. We'll see what those are. And the second part of this is repair the land that has been damaged. We've done great harm to the earth and we need to repair that. So the first thing is to repair the land and expand the acreage for food supply. Notice, Tim, in particular, these are natural solutions and they don't rely on technology, which may or may not work and they require no maintenance or replacement when worn out. So that's what I mean. This plan is a natural solution, uh, as opposed to those who would tell you various, oh, we have to, uh, for example, build more nuclear reactors. Next. Now, while we develop environmental policies, this is something that I think all nations can agree upon. We saw that coercion. They can rule agree upon in order to repair the damage already done through the application of science to nature. That's all I'm doing. Now the methodology, we're, we're fixing what is called the natural infrastructure to five of the eight habitats in particular. Uh, you can see the list there. That's one, two, and three. Next slide. Now these are the three most important slides. After you see these three slides, you can go to sleep or go to coffee, but you will have the essence of this presentation. I'm gonna warn you <laughs> in advance. One, we preserve and expand the national forests and rainforests around the world, very simply. These are close, contiguous tree canopy with moisture dependent vegetation. You may have, if you are, may have heard of deciduous trees, those are forests where the trees leave, lose their uh, leaves. Number two, okay, we got one out of the way. Number two, what ecosystem should we do? Create inland waterways. These are floodplains along rivers of, are, are particularly suitable for the installation of wetlands. And this will provide clean water. These wetlands will provide clean water to Streams. And they're critical for habitat. If you're a nature animal lover, uh, wetlands are full of abundance with life. And due to uh, this, and the last part is due to their high level of nutrients, freshwater marshes, for example, marshes and swamps are one of the most productive ecosystems on earth. So now we got two down, one more to go. Next slide. And the last one that I will present to you is that while we engage in topsoil management to improve 
ex the existing uh, uh, land, farmland and expand. This is the important thing. Through this process that I'm recommending, we can expand the acreage for food. And we'll see it is in fact being done as we speak here tonight. Now what you wanna do is produce a ground cover with the highest concentration of organic matter and set it in motion. You need about one to five inches. And it includes all sorts of materials. There's a list there. By the way, this PowerPoint presentation is posted on our website in several locations in our library of, of PowerPoint slides. So if you want to go back, which I know you will want to do, uh, and you can review this yourself, share it with your friends. It's very important that then instead of like holidays coming up, your family might want to get together and review this PowerPoint. Next slide. All right, we're going to cover the big ones first and possibly the most interesting to everyone here. And how do we improve land for cultivation? Um, this is, we, what we have to do in essence is working on the, what is called the pedosphere. You hear a lot of talk about atmosphere. This is the pedosphere, the outer, outermost layer on the earth. And there's two aspects to this. You don't have to read all this. There's fertility of the soil, which are the chemicals in the soil. And then you have the loam, which is the structure of the soil. You ever seen deep, rich? When they came and Abe Lincoln came, and the first time he put his plow to the prairie, they discovered that the soil underneath was, was called silty loam. And it was silty loam to the point of like 16 feet deep. It's just an incredible, thing that they discovered. They used to think it was, it didn't, trees didn't grow there and the land wasn't any good. And then it's like the expression, you couldn't be more wrong, my friend. It was the most fertile soil on the planet by, by no means. So that's the two things that we have to work on the fertility and the loam will show you on the next slide. Okay. Oh, by the way, I, um, before I just want to mention one other thing. Silt, uh, there's, there's different things. Like I talk about the texture, there's different things in soil, your grand saddle. Silt is one of the lower runs. Clay actually is compacted soil. Many people mistake uh, clay, uh, compacted soil for clay when it is not clay. It's simply soil that has been compacted. That's one of the things why farmers uh, plow up uh, their fields is because clay isn't necessarily a good growing medium. Next one, which one are we on? Land cover. That's the next Go one. back. Just a quick one there. Uh, I'm just talking about land cover is the observed biophysical cover of the Earth's surface. And scientists are warning that there are uncertainties about our food supply. It's just not my idea. It's not something I made up. And what we're going to need are resilient food systems. Um, a system that can withstand disturbances from, while maintaining its usual level of operation. I think we can achieve that. Next one with the topsoil sacks. Now uh, there you can see the topsoil is in fact being marketed today. <laughs> it's used by most notably home gardeners. Uh, we, we have to upscale this production. Now, one reason uh, we could do this, now in nature, it takes 100 years uh, of topsoil in nature. Okay, next one. Now, this is a quick one to go over. You can come back and look at this. What exactly is topsoil? It's a combination of all these ingredients, sand, nutrients, limestone. We know what is needed. It's not new science. It's already been established what constitutes good topsoil. Now there's another thing, I, I don't want to confuse you. There's topsoil and then there's a ground cover above that and the term normally used is mulch. But you put down a layer of topsoil and then on top of it a, a ground cover and you put a ground cover that is absorbent to air and water. 
but that would preclude, you know, erosion and things like that. So that's the basic process of this. Now, uh, there's another thing. This is really cool. I like this. In making topsoil today, you include something called hydrogels. And what the heck is a hydrogel? Actually, technically, it's something that's both a liquid and a solid. But you can put hydrogels in, in your topsoil, and it reduces the need for watering by as much as 50 to 70%. That's what I mean. We can expand the acreage uh, for farming significantly for a period these last five years. They are not expensive either. I price them for a few dollars. It's like $15 a pound. You could probably do an entire field that would last three to five years uh, for 50 bucks. So it's not an expensive uh, ingredient to add to your topsoil. This goes into further detail what we're talking about. It absorbs water up to 1,500 times uh, in a ratio. I was thinking of getting some hydrogel and putting it in the soil of my house plants. And therefore, I, it would mean I would only have to water my house plants once a year. And they'd be perfectly fine. Just get cactus. You know, um, but anyhow, these are water absorbing polymers. You can read more about them if you like next. And what we should do is in each bio region in the United States is establishing a processing center for producing topsoil and liquid nutrients should be established uh, by the Bureau of Land Management. Okay, so this is the government on next one. You're on one day a year, right? No, industrial chemistry. Okay. Does that one come up? Yeah, industrial. Okay, that's, there you see a, a green factory in motion. I'll go into further detail and what is going on in that operation. But we have industrial chemistry. Now that's, that's what, what, do you, what do you put in here, topsoil? Now wood chips are ready thing, wood bark, uh, down bottom, any kind of plant meter after you harvest your corn, the stalks are turned into silage. That's what you see, any kind of plant material. Down there is green, paper products, quite suitable. Anyhow, these are for the processing thing. Other things you can use are the waste of food processing. The peels, the skins, the cores, the pits, the stems, the seeds, twigs, everything that we process our food uh, for the market. That's another thing you can add. Another thing, now this is something everyone can do. I don't know why if they're necessarily coercion, but 50% um, of our municipal garbage, 50% is compostable according to what I'm recommending. And there's no reason this creates no undue hardship to use the green bin, uh, but 50% of your municipal waste is usable uh, to produce good topsoil. I was talking about a ground cover. Ground cover is also a good way of recycling materials such as old tires. You can use them in limited supply distribution, old, old truck tires and car tires, uh, depending on being spread, uh, would be would prevent all, all erosion and allow for water and gas movement. That's what you want in your soil. You want that going back and forth. Why? We're going to see that. Why? I was thinking another thing we could use. If you want to be natural about it, when I lived in Appalachia, I noticed that the forest was covered both with moss and lichen as a ground cover. Lichen was everywhere. They're little <laughs> tiny plants. You also find lichen growing in tundras. They live where they're above the tree line. And they're little tiny, they even flower. You can use a magnifying glass and see, look at the little flowers. But lichen is found all over the place. It makes an excellent natural ground cover as well as moss. Actually, you sell moss and square shoots. Another thing that's possible on the coastal areas of the United States is the use of seaweed or kelp. It's a naturally occurring fertilizer <laughs> that occurs in nature and it grows at an incredible rate. 
There's a 5,000 mile seaweed belt headed towards Florida. That's in the news. They'd be glad to get rid of it. Um, next one is the before. Okay, there you can see, I can take land like that and next turn it into land like that by doing this process. We're going to get to it. Good question. Um, now, one of the problems, we also have to make some adjustments in current agricultural practices. One of this is the amount of nutrient removal. We are, like here, when you're baling, baling A, they try to get three seasons per year. Well, that's nutrient extraction and you're not putting anything back. We have to implement a uh, crop rotation. Oh. We have to implement crop rotation. Um, now, the basic rule on rotation, rotating crops, is the more the better. Uh, three is better than two. Here's, the, here's what they say. Three is better than two. Four is better than three. Anytime you, you, you rotate crops, you're putting nutrients back into the soil as opposed to systems where you're removing it. Now, why is, uh, how, does, how does the plants work? Why is this, what is this going to do with the atmosphere, which is where we began? But plants absorb, you got that one carbon sequestration? Mm -hmm. Plants absorb CO2 from the air and they exude carbon through their roots to feed the soil organisms. So now the thing that we look at this one, uh, the figures I came across, we're, we're producing 15 times more greenhouse gases than somebody in an undeveloped country. That's what I mean. We better get moving on some of this. Next one. Another thing we can do simply in cities is to look at increase the amount of green green acreage in urban areas. We're pouring concrete over everything. And what the end result of all that concrete, actually, this is terribly anti-ecological. All that concrete parking lots and all that increases the temperature of a city by 15 degrees on average every night. So that's what I mean. You can see what this city did. OK, uh, climate adaptation. Um, now, I showed you there of the prairie system. That is one of the most fascinating, and I spoke about it earlier, the prairie grass root system. I'm fascinated when I first studied and learned about them, how they hold soil in place and absorb water. And they form natural data plant communities. And these are spread over space and time. That's what I mean. I mentioned ecosystems, a, a, a prairie grass of metal, is one of the most incredibly uh, ecosystems you're going to find. Uh, okay, next one. There is also some people call these meadows. Uh, there is a meadow society. These are people that like wildflowers and things like that. Uh, and they give you the club gets together, and their purpose is to create meadows. In particular, Great Britain. This is next. Grasses grow at the stem. <laughs> Uh, this is how a uh, prairie system works. And seasonal fires, a fire is actually beneficial. Uh, it removes a little air and allows, that's what I mean, it, it renews. This is only a thing. A fire normally you think would be a problem, but certainly not to this system. Uh, now, one other thing, why we've got to start doing this kind of thing is that uh, we are, in fact, losing food supply due to urban sprawl. You can see there the current uh, concentration of arable farmland. I think we can expand farmland significantly on the East Coast. The West might take some doing, but that's certainly possible. And the value of farmland, I think if we implement my program to the fullest extent possible, the price of farmland will come down significantly and virtually anybody can become a farmer and afford acreage of 3,000 
uh, if they so want. Next one, free market capitalism. Okay, this is this is what you guys love. Um, yes, and big ag is taking over. They control 80% of the beef market, the corn and grain trade. Uh, all beef is processed by four companies. Uh, chicken market controlled by Tyson. Uh, swine is about four different companies. Um, in one respect, Big Ag is good at what they do. What they do, they they do. I mean, you may have questioned their methodology. Certainly, that issues can be raised regarding it and their their procedures. Um, but they are darn good at what they can do, and. They've been on the loss of the family farm. The government has been supporting family farms for about 75 years, unlike other small industries. You guys are the free market capitalist guys, the natural competitiveness. The downside is, of course, there is evidence of the monopolistic activities by Big Act, particularly as it came to see the pesticide issues. That is very real and should be addressed. That has gone on too long. Anyhow, but they're good at what they're doing. And that's, that's, that's what I mean. This is what Big Ag comes up with. Talk about intensification. I mentioned that term. Uh, like here, on average, they've been producing two more bushels per acre of corn per year. That's not bad. We've been growing corn a long, long time. To be increasing the yield at that rate, now you may question how they do it, Certainly is incredible that we're still in the process of increasing proportional yields. Now, one of the things they do is like intensification. I don't think you can put more corn stock in a, in a field than these guys do. What happens now? There is, of course, a specialty market for food. What happens to them? Um, if they're, here's, let me tell you this. Many, many of the people on the left, they want um, organic food. Organic, I want organic food. That's fine. The only thing is, if the food supply is challenged, you're going to take any kind of food you can get. We need four pounds of food per day on average. Now, through my system, they can, by increasing the amount of acreage, it's about the only way you can expand upon the specialty farming. It's a niche, it's, it's small operations. They're not really farming. They're large gardens. And unless you expand the acreage, they simply are not gonna be able to operate. So that's what I mean. It should be advantageous uh, uh, like this. There also is some issue, and this one is, one that can easily be debated what exactly is organic farming. Uh, if anybody could tell me, let me know. I'll buy you dinner. Uh, we are going to need food to feed the world. We only have 60 crops left. 60. So enjoy your meal. You might want to get a calendar and cross off the years or add it up, but there's only 60 crops remain. Uh, under normal circumstances. They call that plant forward dining. One of the things we could do is cut down perhaps on the infinite variety of products uh, processed and put in supermarkets, something like 15 to 60,000. Uh, now, what are we eating? What are we eating? We There are about 50,000 edible plants. Basically, we eat about 15 of them. Um, and those and they're basically rice, corn, and wheat make up most of it. There you see a list there. Actually, one of the interesting things there is the most edible plant is the dandelion weed. Uh, one of the things the government has to do, some crops have this, others do not. We need to have a heritage seed library and doing research and the cultivation and specialization of the 15 most common edible plants. Some of the photos with the exception of one our actual photos. <laughs> I'll let you try and figure out which one. Uh, another thing we could do with the seed issue uh, is uh, 
focus on edible uh, self-seeding perennials. Uh, there you can see a list there. These are seeds that produce their, plant their own seeds. Another thing is each community in a city should have a public orchard. Uh, food trees shared by the community growing in accessible areas. We got to learn a little socialistic applications here. I know I would get a question here on hydroponics, so I wanted to throw in one slide. Uh, and that's where water is used as the medium uh, in, in place of soil. Uh, Disney, Disney and Epcot as an installation, I've taken a special tour of this. They got a tomato tree. Um, you know, it's very, it's a relatively simple process. Uh, it's really though suitable only perhaps, I think, for green leafy lettuce type plants. It seems to be suited to that. Uh, there doesn't appear to be any adaptation for the other crops that we reap. I'm actually, you would like to try this tomato tree though. Now, the other thing about expanding acreage of farmland, actually, it's going to mean that we have less, and I like this term, confinement agriculture. Um, it's going to actually increase the amount of pasture land that is available. Cows do better if they can eat grass and are fed strictly a diet of corn. Uh, so if you increase the acreage, uh, now there's some people that are, uh, advocate a uh, vegan diet. However, this would make it possible. Now, the one other thing, a misconception that I would like to correct is that I often hear among the advocates of vegans is that, and on the left, is that cows produce methane. Yes, they do. Not much. Not anything to be alarmed about. They amount for only 3.3%. All of agriculture account for only 10% of the greenhouse gases produced. So cows themselves are not the evil force that get rid of, they want an argument, we're seeking for an argument, to not eat meat, but methane production cannot be attributed to cows to any significant event. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's pretty good. The more they can use can be uh, used with, without reprocessing. Uh, chickens is another, chickens as well. Pigs, yeah, that's a problem though. Um, but just want to make that clear, you could dispute me on it. Next one, Tim. Oh, I just wanted to mention, this is the very latest technology. In fact, we just established outside of Chicago in which you, you grow meat in a laboratory. There's some of the devices you use for growing meat. They can do it upon the um, meat can be grown in four to six weeks as opposed to raising a cow which takes eight to market 18 to 24 months and it's a little expensive, $17 a pound. Another thing about increasing pasture land and animals are really very good for agriculture because they look at the, what they've done with the Great Plains. There's a perfect indication of the animal integration. Uh, uh, that's what I mean, but actually I just see something in there. Most people don't know this, but our, the cows would never make it in the wild. I just wanted to add this in because I spoke about Indians one time, but in Judeo-Christian culture, uh, man is thrown out of the Garden of Eden. The Indians think just the opposite. The Great Spirit placed man in the Garden of Eden. Next one. All kinds of talk about regenerative agriculture. Regenerative agriculture is nothing but another word for dry land farming, which was used for centuries by the Indians of the Southwest, Central and South America in which you do not disturb the soil and it, it keeps the moist. There's the essence of it. Keep the CO2 in and keep the H2O in. And that's it. Now, now the one disadvantage from a farming perspective is that in order to engage 
in regenerative agriculture, you have to buy all new farm implements. Very expensive, very expensive. The seed planter is at least $30,000 just to look at. We'll get some more on equipment. Um, okay, the next one, how Australia? And he asked, is this being done anywhere? In Australia, my friend, um, they're regreening their desert. Many of you familiar with uh, Australia is a very dry, hot country. And they think there's an emerging market for food and they want to take advantage of that. And there you can see actual photographs of what they're doing in Australia. I even have sent an invitation to the government of Australia or the Department of Agriculture to look at my PowerPoint slides. I invited them to the program here tonight. Uh, talking about equipment there, you see uh, this big ag. This is why it's called big ag. You put a guy on a tractor and he goes uh, for eight hours in a straight line. That's the size of farms. And the equipment is incredible. 16 row crop machines like that. Now I want to think one of the ways this problem, now this is a central aspect of food production. In socialized countries in Russia, they only at the start of the revolution in 17, they only had 65 tractors. In 25 years, they had to be the first place in the world for the production of tractors. That's what socialized agriculture can do. We've got to look at it. One of the things we could do, and this would, I highly recommend this as well, nationalized farm equipment implement production and maintenance. Production and maintenance of the implements necessary for agriculture. That's one way to cut big ag. Next, there's solar panels you can get as well. You can run energy free and reduce that 10% uh, like this. Another thing you yeah, can do equipment wise is a device out there, uh, self-driving robots. Robots on the farm, and this one to get rid of all the weeds for you. So, but that should be a pretty pricey. Instead of herbicides, you got that. Another aspect that has to be talked about are pesticides. And most of the people would recommend biopesticides. Now, pesticides, toxic products, carry a three level warning. You got caution, warning, and danger. So you get on their labors. Now, there's natural pesticides. It's the plants of catnip, garlic, lavender. Um, Biopesticides have a very narrow scope and they suppress rather than eliminate a pest population. There's about 500 insects that want to eat our food before we get it. And they have to be controlled uh, in some fashion. Um, next. Uh, this it's a fascinating topic, the whole topic of insects in, in, in nature. Uh, you have to look at the canopy to the ground. That's the space they generally occupy, the vertical structure. You want to you want to also help. You want to don't want to harm <laughs> friendly. I mean, you want to make it a friendly plant community for those insects you like. I have a bush in my backyard, and I swear. It had well over a thousand bees. It wasn't that big a bush. That was the perfect, that was ideal. They really loved that. I mean, I was even got a little scared. There were so many that they were cutting each other out. Oh, well, another thing about uh, insects is it's a tricky matter. This happened the other day when you don't take adequate measures to control the population. Uh, one last thing, you're a railroad man. This one's for you. Railroads who move, uh, next one, Tim. Railroads who retrieve raw materials for fertilizer. It takes one tank car of fertilizer. We're talking about fertilizer. Uh, and I can do 770 acres of, uh, of corn for one farm. So that's what I mean producing topsoil. There's our delivery system. One last thing I like to measure. It, it's ecologically, you'll see a transportation guy there. He, one has to figure in uh, certain things are being looked at right now. There was some advantage 
to growing locally. And that's to cut back on the mileage of food, food miles. These are the distances that the food you may be eating right now or today or tomorrow to the Chicago terminal market. Apples travel about 1,500 miles, uh, grapes. Uh, so food miles uh, is something that can be looked at. The transportation community could work in conjunction uh, with the farming community. Uh, great, luckily, I'm gonna go through these kind of quick on you, otherwise we get tired. Um, wetlands are swamps and marshes uh, dominated by uh, grasses and rushes. Uh, this is the potential wetland. This is the second part. We have to create wetlands. And you can see among the rivers in the United States. Uh, existing wetland areas already exist in the United States. We simply have to ensure that. And you can see the places where it needs to be expanded. Wetlands uh, are good for flood control. You can see here along the shoreline, testing along the shoreline uh, against erosion. Uh, they absorb most of the energy. Next one, filtration of impurity. Keep it up with me. I'm trying to um, get there. Wetlands, uh, marshes, and swamps are natural water purification systems. All right, there's one of these outside the shore, as in Toronto, they have a marshland along the shore, Lake Ontario. It's a park. It is purifying the water of Toronto by putting it into the lake. We'll see why this is important. We've got to have natural purification processes. That's what I mean, an eco natural ecosystem uh, to benefit the earth. They, they engage in chemical, many pollutions washed out uh, by wetlands, the, the roots. They, they remove as much as 90% of the sediments. Uh, okay, next one. Also, uh, wetlands of animals just thrive in these shows. You know, they, there's all sorts of detritus that they can eat, and they later on their food for larger predatory fish. You can see the guy, the bird eating the little froggy. Okay, well, another thing, we need water um, for a water basin. Put supply water to the oceans. Now we've got major basins. There you see the major water basins of the United States. You've got to have wetlands uh, along those to ensure that the quality of water that we're putting in the ocean is suitable. Uh, here's what happens when you don't do that. You end up with a dead zone, such as presently thousands of miles of dead zone outside of New Orleans. Trap weather one, the ecosystem, so I go quickly to her, uh, only about half at the dawn of human civilization. We cut down 15 billion a year. It takes, each tree takes up to 50 pounds of CO2. Um, rainforest of the world, uh, have been around for 70 million years. However, they're only 3% of the surface. We sort of can do better than that. Uh, one third of the white forests are gone. Uh, one third are in trouble. And uh, one third uh, remain intact. Uh, one thing about a rainforest is they're is very dark. It's the canopy that is actually the growing place. One thing we can do there's a lot of pressure to turn uh, rainforest into cult monocultures. If you want to boycott something, you know, you like to boycott things, I'd recommend boycott bananas. Because that's what happens to a lot of the rainforest. No bananas for me. Uh, and palm oil. It's used in a multitude of processes in, in industrial processing. And, uh, more than half of all pets and products contain palm oil. That's what's happening to the rainforest. Or, or, or this. One, one acre forest can is equal to the pollution put out. They absorb the pollution of the car driven 26,000 miles. Here's national forest in the United States. That's certainly we have to work on. There's a 
the forests of Illinois. We've had 300,000 carloads of wood shipped annually by rail. That can certainly be cut back. Um, next one, we need to restore forests lost to fire. There's been devastating fires of late. Next one, a tree farm is not a forest. Keep that in mind. We want to, like I said, just sit with forests. Next one, GMO trees. I'm per perfectly for this. We need heat resistant trees. There's an operation in Canada. They're trying to collect drought resistant seed trees and they dispense them for free. Trees are not turns out, trees are just like any other plant and subject to drought. So if we can do something to cultivate better species. Another thing about GMO, of course, the the territory of marauding insects is changing and expanding. If anything, it expands. Uh, so unless you want to use pesticides. One other thing to look at is that what is your city doing regarding urban tree care? Do you have trees up and down the block? Or you like my neighbor, he tore up his lawn and put down a bunch of concrete. I, I notice all the trees in Chicago are tagged. They know where they're at. Uh, another reason we need forests, of course, are the little critters, the animals, and like here, the coyote the other day, uh, Rocky, the coyote, uh, they didn't really have, weren't certain about releasing him. Okay, the next one is sort of topics, Tim. Got it. We'll be clicking to this. The government has to step in and intervene. I think we should get rid of states all together and organize around bioregions. Uh, there are 12 within the confines of the United States. Yeah. We should establish a U.S. food co-op uh, for nationalization of all U.S. food production. If you need food, you should be able to go to the People's Food Depository there. Well, I welcome all citizens to good standing. Another thing, if you want to learn about food production, this series is running on Antenna TV, Crest TV. And you can get it on YouTube. It's called the Food Factory. Very informative. Then 15 segments, and you see how food is processed. Everything under the sun, little fishy crackers and donuts and bread and everything under the sun. Uh, another thing about collective agriculture is that it would remove a lot of the problems in the fields, fast food, and processing factories. In the for the employees. Um, another thing you might want to catch is that producing crops under pressure, as we are going to be confronted with with global warming, and the same thing existed in England during the war. They were under pressure to produce food, and you can see what they did. They would send people around, for example, to inspect each farm to see if they were in compliance uh, with the standards the government had. This is brand new. So products that are sustainably sourced ingredients. And there's only one or two or three on the market, Hillman's mayonnaise. And these are grown, this is a complete eco food. So if you're an eco person, that's the one you want to look for. Please support the Earth Bill, HR 598. We have bi-weekly meetings of Illinois supporters on Wednesdays at one o'clock. Now on our last, next last slide, <clears throat> on every episode of the old Star Trek, they would come into a new planet and Captain Kirk would turn to uh, the Vulcan and say, give me a report on this place. Fuck. Fuck. And um, so he would, there you could see, they're returning after the five year voyage and he would tell, as in every episode, he'd say, report, what is, what is the nature of this planet? And here you see, Captain, here's what he said. There. It indicates it's an uninhabited planet with no apparent life forms, a high surface temperature, and an atmosphere of CO2. That's the Earth five years, 2030 at least, five years from now. All right, everyone, pay attention, wake up. This question I've submitted to each of you. 
Are you going to advance Chuck's plan? Are you going to be with me in advancing this plan to save the earth? I ask each of you. You can answer one of two ways. One, yes, yes, it is well thought out. And I am convinced that this is what we need to do and quickly. Now you can answer the other way. You're freely to answer. You could say to maybe later since I have other things to do right now. So the choice is yours. Okay, thank you for coming. I hope you learned something. Okay. All right, uh, let me get the share off. And uh, so- Come uh, on, guys. You're gonna have- Come on, Eddie, you can give it to me. We're gonna have questions and answers now, if you'll allow. Uh, All right, come here now, what do you- All right. I'll um, repeat the question. Uh, should the Lake Michigan, we would be surrounded by wetlands, would we look like a swamp? Would there be wetlands in the, in, um, the Chicago River, or what would that look like? If you had uh, every river is is suitable for the establishment of wetlands. What would it look like? What, what would, would it look like? Would it look like a swamp? Would it have moss? No, have you ever been on? I, I gave you the photo there. That shoreline, you've got to protect your shoreline. Now, there's nothing wrong with uh, wetlands for shoreline production. I, I've been to Cape Cod many times. That entire thing is one. My question is, what would it look like? I, I got to give you a picture. I, I could go back, but it's the one where you said uh, plants growing along a river with a fence. I've supplied a photo. You'll be, you'll be able to have the beach and the dog beach and the... Yeah, you could have a beach, but you've got a mile, miles and miles of of coastline, uh, you know, I, I was on the coast of the United States um, on a trip uh, and we travel along the coast. And you mentioned that there's like a, one beach for every five or 10 miles. It's just, you don't need that much beach, you know, it just goes on and on and on. Uh, if you see the real coastline, but you've got to do something they add, or look, you want the you want the shoreline to you got to do combat erosion. And the water could I'm very much trouble for visualizing what that would look like. It, there's this pictures furnished. All right, go back. I'm sorry, no. Oh, go no. back. No. She can't visualize it. Go back to wetlands. She right. can't no. I Go, just go back a few. It's not that many back. Hang on. Is that the reverse? Yeah, I, I got to get it up. Don't worry. I'm sorry. I... <laughs> ah, God, yeah. Okay, here we go. All right. Where were I at, Charlie? I'm going back. All right. Where are you at, Charlie? It's a. Uh... It's called the not so obvious benefit of wetlands. One little higher, a couple more, a couple more, a couple more. Almost there. One more, one more. There, there. That's what it looks like. Okay. It's not so bad. Okay. It's all right, Dad. We drained the wetlands. It was wetlands originally. No, no, we're. No, it's just that the, the Lake Michigan is so recreational. Can you just kind of put a fence and then put this kind of peat moss and have you just kind of breeze winds going out of it then? Or... Get, get there's no shortage of beaches. How many people here in beaches? Like, there's a thousand miles of shoreland. We can share. Yes, next. Go ahead. Who's next? Thank you. The, the wetland is it's cleaning the water 
So you want to, you want, if you want to go swimming, you want dirty water, or clean water. Choice is yours. <laughs> go on. All right, Jan. Well, in Exactly. She's saying is in Rogers Park they created a park that um, was an, a marshland, a swamp, <clears throat> not a swamp, but a, a wetland. And now, then there, when it, one of the times when it rained, uh, that the the, the uh, it, it's called the Loyola Habitat Restoration. Yeah, and, I, and, that, and it was it was covered with water, and there were. Uh, Coming in way inland where the water was. That's, right. That's what I said. The wetlands are natural animal waters. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing is there's another natural um, uh, um, wetland on Ashland Avenue put in by the Park District. I believe it's Ashland or Western. Um, it's, I don't know the name of the park. It's on right uh, on the near south side. There's also in my neighborhood. Yes, I believe so. And then there's a, another thing I should say is that they have a brand new park in my neighborhood and it's a natural prairie grassland. So yeah, these are these are nice. That's what I mean. Yes. All right, next one. Who's got another one? All right. Uh, we'll go with Dr. Bob. Lights and loud, Dr. Bob. All right, lights and loud. Thank you, sir, for coming. I appreciate it. I guess I can sign you. I can sign him up. Okay, go ahead. Nice and loud, Bob. Secretary of Talk, you mentioned that climate change, and you mentioned how it was a media danger. Well, Um, there actually is an organization of people engaged in public health issues, and the current topic this past week, we're putting together a warnings about heat dangers that are anticipated. And we have had one time in Chicago, I believe it was in 98, in which there was severe uh, loss of life due to increased heat. 95, thank you, Andy. Uh, we do not want a repeat of that, but as I say, these were public health physicians recommending that uh, things be done uh, to be ready in the event we have another heat catastrophe as we had in 1995. Uh, now, there, the other thing about climate change is that you end up with all sorts of dramatic changes to weather. And I don't know if you want all of them. If you want severe droughts uh, and who knows what kind of rainfall, flooding or drought, it kind of wrecks the environment. You, that's what you want, you know. If you can encourage that or you can join up with Chuck and his other pals. Okay, okay uh, Jake, you're next on the phone there. Go oh, ahead, Jake. Okay. Can, Jake, can go you ahead. hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear yes, me? Sir. Can yes, you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, I, okay. I got, I got, I got two questions. What are, first of all, what are biopesticides? Number one, and number two, 
You talked about uh, growing meat in a laboratory. How do you do that? All right, I'm thinking of the second one first. Um, there are devices, lab-grown meat. Eden has the advantage of seeing it. They has the factory outside in Glendale, Illinois. Uh, quite a sizable one, over a million square foot. And they're producing it um, through this process of uh, cells, cell growth. I don't fully understand the technology. Uh, but they are able to produce meat that can be packageable in the market, just like you buy we buy hamburger uh, today. Uh, what was the other one about pesticides? Let me tell about pesticides. I didn't get bio, a chance. What are biopesticides? Bio well, you have, okay, this is the one that we are recommending. Uh, those are truly, here's the problem. There's a lot of misconception, and the organic growers are to blame for this. They're saying they don't use pesticides. They say there's two types of pesticides, natural pesticides and synthetic. I say to that, that's, that's a lot of do what diddy. They're all chemicals. And they say, oh, we're growing organic food and we use pesticides, but they're natural pesticides, not, not synthetic. So buy my food. Now, biopesticides are ones that truly are organic. And that's what I mean. They do not kill insects. They may interrupt their life cycle or something like that. They're not deadly substances. They don't have the severity. Now, another thing I'd like to add about pesticides and herbicides in food. Um, the real danger is, it, is when the pesticide or herbicide is sprayed on the food, the fruit or the vegetable itself. Now, what that means is is that if the fruit or vegetable has a hard, hard outer casing, you don't have to worry too much about organic food or it being having any pesticides. And what do I mean? Uh, cucumbers are basically impervious to the pesticides and herbicides. Melons, I need you and um, Cantaloupes. Uh, apples are about mid-range. They do have a hard skin, but they're somewhere about... Now, the source of information on this is the Environmental Working Group puts out a list of yes and no uh, foods. Uh, Consumer Reports gets involved in this topic, but they're a little intense and extreme. Um, now, another fruits, now here's another fruit. fruit you might want to avoid, uh, strawberries and peaches, if sprayed. Now, other people say, okay, doesn't it get in through the leaves and the roots? And the term for that is called uh, in, in transclusion, where the pesticide enters through the leaves or the roots and makes its way to the food. Uh, not that common an incidence of, of how you to be of concern. Let me just say, yes, all, all of these are of concern. That's not the method that pesticides enter our diets. It, that it, uh, translocation is the term. The, the amount of translocation of chemicals into the food generally is not great. Now it changes. Uh, rice is probably not a good idea. Uh, now, there's another thing too about chemicals and food. There's even things that people don't realize is other kinds of chemicals are sprayed on crops as they're being grown. Wheat, for example, is sprayed during the growing season and particularly near the harvest um, uh, to make it a better storage crop. Corn, is very, corn is virtually impervious 
the pesticides and herbicides. I guess because it has a husk and all that. Uh, corn has virtually no residue in any ma manner um, to these substances. So that's what I mean. It depends as well as on the crop. Did that answer your answer question, Jake? Yeah, yeah I, I guess does. so. Okay. John, you're, John, you're next. John Beasley, go ahead and answer your question. Mr. Beasley, how are you? Welcome. Unmute, Mr. Beasley. <laughs> you're muted, Mr. Beasley. Go ahead and unmute. Yeah, I got a question. Unmute. Uh, okay, let me. So, um, yeah, so now. my question is are our uh, natural flood flip? <laughs> Uh, flood, uh, flood, flood plains a good thing. A natural flood plains a good thing. Yeah, they go through the water. Uh, that's uh, yeah, it's a great there. Uh, we've got to increase the number of them. There. Uh, there's a natural filtration process and a natural habitat for wildlife. There's a whole ecosystem that gets cooking. That's what I mean. Nothing better for filtering water in a natural fashion that we put into the ocean otherwise. But yes, natural. Uh, you know, now, of course, you don't want, to, you know, egregious flooding. I'm not in the core of the engineer's town. But yeah, there is an extreme. Uh, the, the true purpose, a good, a good wetland actually will control flooding. Let's put it that way. That's what I've read. An adequately mm -hmm. designed and floodplain or marsh will preclude disastrous flooding. Does that answer it? Yes. Okay. Yes. Mike Lehman, you're next. Mike Lehman, what do you got? Plastics. Not the topic tonight. What about it? That, 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 hey, you can go over there and argue with all the, the as I said, the, you want to coerce, coerce people and to do this, you have to do this, you can't do that. Yeah, I, you can't use straws, can't use plastic knives and forks. That's what I mean. I, my whole plan was to avoid that confrontation. The Chicago Greens has an organization for many years we're going to do it again this January. And we always recommend everybody take a vow to have a plastic bottle for a year. So can we sign you up? Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously, they go in the landfill. You know, they are recycled. And wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm sorry. You're trying to, you, there are one easily, I don't know how many types of plastic there are. Yeah. And you don't know what that is. Right. So you don't know that it, you just said, declared that it's not, not. And how do you know? They haven't figured out how to recycle it. Yes, they have. Yes, they have. Everybody else. Economically. I need more power to do it. What are you it? talking about? And we had Mike, Tom Shepard and I had a tour of recycling centers around Chicago and they're producing bales and bales of those bottles uh, being recycled. They, well, that go bear a double. What do you think? We saw it. We saw it. You Mike, didn't take the tour. I don't know where you were. We had experts. We had experts. And they took us from one installation to another. You didn't take the tour. Mr. Layman, I worked in a plastics company for a number of years, and we used a lot of her, we used a lot of recycled bottles to make new plant to make new products. Yeah. All you gotta do is uh you grind it down, you recycle it, and you can make new plastic yeah, products out of it. Listen, the only problem with plastics are microplastics getting into the environment. And they, how do they get 
they break down, Mike, it breaks down in nature. That's how microplastics get in nature. It's like sand, but it's plastic. And it's because they degrade in the natural environment. Nobody produces microplastics and dumps it on the beach or in Lake Michigan. So what are you talking about, man? Microplastics are produced naturally. All right, we got that a lot of All right, Johnny. Dan, Johnny, on, what hang do you on, got? Hang on, hang on. Dan, you're on if you want to go, if you want to take your question. It says Dan Warstrad, Weinberg. Yeah, Dan Weinberg. All right, Dan's online. Go ahead. Dan, you're okay. on. All right, I'm on. All right, good. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Tim. Um, you said carbon yeah. dioxide, Charlie. You said carbon dioxide is yeah. uh, eighty percent. Let's keep it down, guys. <laughs> Nitrogen is eighty percent. I just See, the hey, gentlemen. Gentlemen, cease. We got that. We want to get Mike's. We want to get Mike's question. All right, Dan, go ahead. Sorry about it. All right. Again. So you said. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. You said CO2 is 80% of air. It's 20%. Nitrogen is 80%. You've heard of nitrogen, right? What are you talking about? It's my chart. Yeah, it's wrong. CO2 is the most dominant gas. What? Where have you been? Gas? CO2 is 80%? Really? Dan, we had an entire evening of experts on CO2. It's a dominant greenhouse. We had a whole program. Uh, yeah, right but I'm talking about the air. The fucking air, the total no, air. No, you misread the chart. Uh, yeah. You missed, misread the chart. He said 80% yeah. of greenhouse emissions. Didn't say 80% of the air. He said 80% of greenhouse oh, emissions. Oh, OK, OK. Sorry about that. I misunderstood. Yeah. So anyway, so CO two is twenty percent of the air in the in the on Earth in the atmosphere. Eighty oh, greenhouse emissions. Okay, whatever greenhouse emissions. I don't care about greenhouse emissions. Um, okay, let me ask another question. Soil soil can be created in about five years, actually, or even one or two I can years. Do it in a day. What? I can do it in a day. How? Oh, I just listed the ingredients. I even showed a picture of the family. All right, thank you. I'll, I'll forget it. Bye. You put all it right, all together. Right, all right. Listen, um, Dad, wait a minute. I put together soil for my potted plants. It didn't take me five years. I had my own recipe of the ingredients. I put them all together, mixed them all together. And that's where the pot said I was. And then I did it. Yeah, I did it in an hour. What did you five the years. benefits of the THC, Charlie? Matter of fact, what he doesn't understand is, I, seriously, he doesn't understand that there's a difference. Topsoil doesn't contain soil. Maybe you didn't see that on the one slide. Does not contain soil. All right. All that right. may take you a while to understand. All right, Jonathan, go ahead. All right, John. I agree with 99% of what you said. All right, Mike, we're going to on board. We got Johnny on now. Did you see the light? Uh, thank you for a fascinating talk. Uh, I, uh, I really like the plan. It sounds like FDR in his, uh, what was it, CCC? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Citizens Conservation. Civilian Conservation Corps. Uh, it sounds like this is a modern day progression of that, and that's one aspect that I really love about your presentation. I uh, proudly grew up in Bolingbroke, Illinois, uh, very close to several acres of farmland. 
And the particular neighborhood where I grew up uh, in Bolingbrook, a lot of kids who grew up in that neighborhood right next to all these acres and acres of farmland, they had a lot of uh, uh, learning disabilities, migraines. Later on in life, a lot of uh, female members of our community had uh, several miscarriages. There seemed to be a pattern a lot of people who grew up next to these particular cornfields in Illinois of having uh, negative reactions, having grown up there at a young age. So my question to you this evening that I think ties into your topic very well is what is the right amount of time research these chemicals? Because there's absolutely, I place absolutely no validity whatsoever in your anecdotal information about the town of bordering of farmland. Yeah, That's strictly and purely anecdotal. That is basically worthless. Yeah. You know, now you're getting into an area of which I actually am familiar with. It's called a PEL. A, yeah. a permissible exposure level. Yeah. Now, for many substances, it has been established. For other ones, not so. Now, there's not one answer. It determines that when you, you can reasonably be assured that it's not harmful to people or pets, that you now some substances uh, are dangerous under any circumstances. Some substances are dangerous under limited circumstances. Uh, secondhand smoke. So you've been in a room once, what size room with a smoker? Are you exposed? Are you gonna die? You're gonna die? Well, you know, that's what I mean. It is a science, there's a judgment call. I trust the people who do so that they establish these things and use appropriate test methods dependent upon the substance that we're talking about. There are experienced at it. They're fine career federal employees such as myself, and they know what they're doing. They haven't been found wrong. I don't think they've ever been found wrong. To be honest with you, I, I, I could look. I could be mistaken. Now, as a matter of fact, what they also do, and this is true, they are tough on exposure levels, meaning, as the years I've been following, and I'm honest, the amount that you can be exposed to has increased and not be dangerous. That's meaning right. there are so I, I'm always amazed at this, but the first time they set the standard very high I that always exposure is dangerous. And then I go, well, it become less dangerous because they set the standard at first and they're not best to their knowledge at the time. And they said, oh, that happened with asbestos. Doesn't matter if it was one of, one of the major substances that I, I had to deal with. Uh, the danger of asbestos actually went down. And it's not that asbestos got safer, or they made a mistake. It's just that they initially set the standard for exposure very high to preclude anybody from being harmed. Fair enough. I, I saw this movie once called, y'all might remember this film, The Little Shop of Horrors, mm -hmm. where the plant could eat people. Is that possible? <laughs> the plants eat people. Well, yeah, Doctor Who, they do all the time. You know, like a giant penis trap or something. <laughs> they consume people all the time. You know. Thank you for your. All right. Anybody else? Andy. How long have you been studying the subject to put this together? Well, what major sources did you put all the slides? No, no, all over the place, all over the place, and I gradually started piecing it together. I did presentations here 
on the Green New Deal itself. So I was familiar with their ideas. And then and being a greedy, I go multiple sources. I watch uh, documentaries that Dan Weinberg recommends. that has been out there about the dangers of food, things like that on animals. I wish I knew. There's one in particular I watched and the, the other day and 50% of the documentary is all about food. 50% was total nonsense. And the other half was what you did. Well, that's what I mean. I, what, you know, are you looking, who's putting it out? You've got it like in the library. There is this published material. Is it put out by an ex, ex agriculture college? Like any Jamal can get a camera and put together a documentary, right? Yeah. Well, some, of know. Them, some of them are quite good. Yeah. Like here's a guy who watches them all the time, and that's his source of information. But anybody can buy a, a camera for what, 50 bucks these days? Yep. And you can make your own documentary. And then they're making money selling these on you. So they, they get also into hyperbole. The one I was watching, the, the guy begins, I didn't know where my where my food came from. It's all it's kind of like, like it's a secret. I said, what a farm's a secret? Okay. I didn't know. He's in a restaurant. I he stops and okay. he goes, I didn't know where my food comes from. All right. Mr. That's, Beasley. That's come what I mean, ahead. Andy. You've got to use. You know, now if they're published, are they published by University Press? You know, if it's just some jamoke, you know, that's why I told you, even sources, I found consumer reports to be a little intense on the subject. Okay, Mr. Beasley, go ahead. Yes, Charlie, have you noticed that the food, the food you're eating, the produce, just doesn't have the taste that it did when you were young. You're entirely correct. You are entirely correct. One topic I have not mentioned is the nutritional value of food. And if you wish to taste, has been reduced in some crops significantly. They're producing them for the market, for the conditions of the grower and the processor. Tomatoes certainly aren't as good as they could do. Certainly not, but they are the type that is suited hard line of worth for marketing, transport. Um, you know, so their primary concern is not necessarily, John, how tasty it is. And that is probably why it is accurate to say if you do your own gardening you probably end up with better tasting vegetables because you're producing varieties that aren't the commercial varieties. And yes, there's significantly less nutrition um, in, in the foods that we eat right now, meaning you better eat more. You got to eat more <laughs> to get the same amount of nutrition. All right, uh, Mike, that's the end of questions. No, I know you're going to have one left. All right. Give my last one. He had his hand raised. All right, Mike. Come on. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. Go ahead, Mike. Go ahead, Mike. Go ahead, Mike. I, I'm not familiar with the system, so I can't count on it. I'm not familiar with that at all. No, I, I, I'm not. That's to me a little. <laughs> no, I, listen. They try to rate it. I told you there's sixty thousand products. And then what variables are you using? A select few? No, I absolutely, as a matter of fact, the more I think about it, that's for like, what? that's 
That's not true. That's not accurate. You disagree with the European Yeah, I do. I, without knowing any more about it, there's too many variables that go in the food. A hot dog with green and juice is a completely nutritious meal. Yeah, that'll get them like a deal or two. <laughs> to try to, that, that's, that's reducio. Are you familiar with the expression? Reducio ad absurdum? That's you, you don't know how to, you, you can't think. You can't think that there's so many things that so listen. That you're on your own there's a million listen. Well, to show that I'm telling you, they talk about the ingredients that go. There's an infinite variety. Even when I said, okay, you said you put flour in in here. Do you know what does flour mean? Do you think that they're all the same? Okay, sure. Maybe you gotta get the right flour. Are they all the same All the flour is the same, right? Okay, guys, we gotta cut That's it. That's what I mean. Let's go to Hi. Let's thank our speaker tonight, Charlie. Yeah, Charlie. And now we're gonna go into a rebuttal period. Give it to Charlie Dozier. Uh, we're gonna do a rebuttals. We're gonna uh, Click on uh, anybody wanting to do rebuttals now uh, is the time to do so. We're going to go about four minutes each, unless we have more. If you want to speak, uh, raise your hand online or come on up. Who's got rebuttals here tonight? All right, we're going to start here online and uh, we'll let you go first. We'll give you about three to four, about four minutes. Feel free, anybody online, I'll get you also in the queue. Come on up and let's go. No, here comes Donald Four minutes. <laughs> yeah, four minutes each. It sounds like his plan comes straight out of the out of Stalin's collectivization, which caused a, a huge famine in the Ukraine. <laughs> Free market <laughs> capitalism is your best path to prosperity. Right. Yeah, it is. <laughs> All right, Jonathan, you want to go next? Go ahead. We'll give you five minutes, Jonathan, because you five usually minutes, my okay, goodness. Have it, John. Uh, he just. All right, Jonathan, go ahead. And don't forget, you guys, you can participate online too. I know Mr. Beasley always got something to say, so come on in. I'll get you up. You want to raise your hand when you're ready. It is really nice uh, to hear you uh, present this presentation this evening for the holidays, Charlie. You worked hard on it. I like your visuals. Mm -hmm. I like how you uh, think outside the box and present a better world, another world for the future uh, that we can look forward to and be enthusiastic about. Uh, it's a depressing thing sometimes to talk about the environment. Uh, this was a presentation that was uh, optimistic and upbeat, but facing the realities of it, that's a real high wire walk to uh, pull off. I, I, I give you thumbs up for your presentation. Uh, what I caution us about is trusting uh, big agriculture, especially uh, the GMO folks like Bayer and Monsanto, because I have very, very personal experience with the nonsense that they spout to the public. Uh, Bayer is one of those companies, Monsanto is one of those companies that they pull out all the stops uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that they cannot be brought into a court for a suit because they literally try to rewrite laws to make it impossible to sue them based on the grounds of they're right, you're wrong. You being the public of planet Earth. So I don't want to quibble with you because I, I, I give your uh, presentation tonight a solid A, but I would, I would caution us all to be very wary of anything that the legal department, especially of Bear or Monsanto says to the public because they've known in the past to lie. They have a financial incentive to lie in big agriculture, and I don't think that's any surprise to anybody at the College of Complexes. Uh, on, a, on, a, on a more uh, festive holiday uh, response to your outstanding 
presentation tonight, Mr. Paydock. Uh, I like how terraforming will affect some of the most beautiful things we have on earth, evergreen trees, fir trees, spruces, and pines, which I grew up as a young boy uh, playing in many areas throughout the Illinois uh, rural and suburban and urban areas around these trees, and they are breathtaking trees. I, I, I probably was. Uh, I was I was raped by, by uh, marijuana smoking nudists in a damn comedy commune, and that's why I turned out the way I did. I go to every Saturday. Damn. In solidarity with our fellow spruce, pine, evergreen, and um, fur brothers and sisters of the natural world. This is called Reflections in the Ornaments. This is our original. You only get this at the College of Complexes. So all you people are at home, you should be here tonight. You're missing out on something very special. Well, a few of them are from Dallas, so. Snowflakes fall in the shadows, beautiful darkness free in another winter moonlit sky. For the town once again, this time of year to see the joy that makes the whole earth cry. Sitting by the fireplace, Charlie Paydock and Tim Bolger on a peaceful eve, while watching the bright warm glow, such a good feeling we can't believe. Everywhere cheerful spirits recite ones we all know. While we complex Collegians are all snuggled up together as we sing each and every song. At Dappers on Addison, we don't care how cold and soggy the weather, because tonight absolutely nothing can go wrong. And as we muse beneath the solar candles, our eyes reveal words strong for our lips to speak. One full at a time, no personal attacks. We got time. Have you heard about thorium? <laughs> As the kids see the stockings all in a row, how much they would all like to take a peek. Girls and boys watch with anxious eyes for the jolly elf who rides the heavy sleigh. It's too loud, it's too loud. Out the window into snowy skies, bringing lots of dreams for all of us to create. The tree is magnificent from the ground up to the star. And the gingerbread makes the house smell so good. If the fire goes out, you need not look far. Mom and Ed are already outside chopping wood. Visions of angels in the fresh snow. I'm thinking about you, Jan, wherever you are. I think she already was. Caroling voices make such a beautiful sound. Outside, the wild winter winds blow. We continue our work to make it this way all year round. Holly, happy days, you complexity collegians, and looking forward to seeing you in 2024. Thank you, Charlie, okay. for an outstanding holiday talk. All right, Mr. Beasley, you're on the air. You want to rebut? Go ahead. Unmute and uh, go ahead. Thank you. Good job, Charlie. So, uh, I, um, I must congratulate Charlie. You, you really put me to shame with all your slides, I must say. I used to do... Um, my talks with uh, you know uh, boards where I had uh, you know drawings and so on, but but you really go to town. So thanks very much for that, really. But um, in terms of rebuttal, um, I um, I must say I, I'm not rebutting anything you've said. In fact, I I agree with most of it. I um I am very concerned about the destruction of our environment, and of course we have a whole gang of um. In, especially in the fossil fuel industry of, of climate change deniers, when we can, in the last few years, we've seen in America, you know, floods, fires, and earthquakes, and everything going on. And so, it's I think it's more than obvious that we are, you know, degrading our environment. I'm also, and we're told every time you go to the doctor, I went the other day, and they say eat, eat healthily, and exercise, and so on. Well, we, we do our best, but the food we eat, I'm, I'm, as I say, I'm the, I remember eating the, 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 going to the groceries in, in London, and the food actually comes in from just outside of London where I grew up, and, and, and the taste was really 
wonderful. When I, when I go back, the, the taste of Brussels sprouts is amazing, <laughs> amazingly good. Here, I, I went to a restaurant, Lowry's in Dallas, it's supposed to be wonderful. I don't know what they did to the Brussels sprouts. It was awful. <laughs> it really was high-priced rubbish, really. The other thing I'm worried about is, you know, we import food from India and China and, and all these other places. And really, I'm, I'm very concerned about, you know, what are we, what are we really eating? The other thing um, along those same lines is, is, the, is the chemicals that we are uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the medicines we uh, compound here, where far, big pharma never tells you where these ingredients come on, coming, are coming from. If they come from China or India, they, boy, we're, you know, we're probably being poisoned slowly by these other ingredients. Some have said that... Um, Capitalism was the best thing going. Well, I, I tend to disagree with that. I'm, I'm more for a command, a command economy, actually. Uh, as, as you know, I, because I mean, this, this huge, the, the, the three attributes that America has actually in its culture are one, greed, two, stupidity, and three, violence. So whatever happens is one of those things or a combination of those things but what we have seen in, in the last uh, nine months or so is huge price gouging, tremendous greed by these hundred major major corporations where their profits have gone up by about 50%, at least on average. Some of them, some of them have profits of uh, hundreds of percent, even 500 and 600%. And the poor, the poor average um, guy, you know, his, his, his wages may have gone up by, say, even 4 or 8%, but nowhere near, nowhere near uh, it, it actually can balance out this, this huge pricing that's gone on. So Tom, uh, Tom Berry down here, who, who runs the college in Dallas, has been writing to everybody. But I do notice that of late, Biden or someone's been pushing down the price of gasoline, which, of course, was the starter of all this price gouging. So, um, but anyway, Charlie, I, I do agree with you. Climate change and and you know, badding bad food and and non-nutritious food is something we we should really do something about it. If we if we if we have to resort to growing our own food, I, I have a little garden back of my house, and I do grow some things, but uh, nowhere near every, everything that I I would like to be growing. So anyway, Charlie, I did, uh, I did grow your, I, I did enjoy your talk. It was excellent. Um, and I wish I could produce another <laughs> uh, talk like that with all your slides and so on. But, you know, really, it's, it's, it's a, hell of a hell of a task to do that. So, Charlie, it was great. Thanks a lot. Okay, Mike, you got to talk. I'll get you next, Ernie. Mike, if you're going to, you want to go next, Ernie, go ahead. All right. Unmute. Well, uh, who do you want to go next? You, Arnie, go ahead. Are you go sure? Next. All right. I'll try I'm and sure. be brief. Yeah. Uh, Charlie, enjoyed the presentation. Learn. I did learn some things. Uh, again, as always, your presentations are, are well-researched and a lot of uh, good uh, graphics and so forth to back them up. That's good. Now, the question I have, is most of what you presented to me, I remember seeing in sixth grade uh, science classes and, and things like that back many, many years ago. None of this seems to be very new knowledge, and maybe you're not claiming that it is, but an awful lot of these techniques and issues are, 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 are not new. And... Um, uh, you you say you don't want to use any form of coercion to get this in. Well, if we're not going to use either coercion or some form of incentives to food producers to use these techniques, uh, how are we going to accomplish it? I mean, this is many years ago. It's, you know, good more than 20 years ago since I was in the sixth grade. And in, in all that time, nothing... Uh, I guess more farmers are probably doing it now than they were then. Better yields, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, it, it's it's not a huge problem. Also, I have a, a kind of, I guess it's more of a question than a comment. Are you really talking about American agriculture and Western agriculture, or is this a problem 
that there's more in the third world countries where they're not using these techniques as well. Or perhaps it's the other other way around. Uh, and then uh, my thought, as always, I find a way to sneak this into most rebuttals. Uh, the way to save humanity and to keep uh, people from starving and eliminate the danger of major wars, et cetera, et cetera, and polluting the planet, which we are doing, is by controlling population. Now, of course, that's very, very, very hard. It's politically almost impossible, socially almost impossible, because people feel the one sacred right they have is to have as many babies as they want to. And and uh, as, so long as this goes on and the population keeps growing, uh, we're, 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 we're going to have all kinds of problems. Any problem that you can name, whether it's lack of food or pollution or anything else, is exacerbated a great deal by increased population and would automatically be somewhat reduced with lower population. I don't have a specific formula on how to do this. Uh, mathematically, we can come up with a formula on how to do it, but politically and socially, very difficult. Anyway, thanks again for the good presentation. Okay, Mike Lehman, go Hello, ahead. Ernie. Ernie, you gotta remember that 75% of the world doesn't live the wasteful, polluting lifestyle of Americans. Now, people in Africa and India live pretty, pretty sustainably and in other uh, continents. But, you know, Americans are filthy, dirty, polluting, oil using, fossil fuel using. Anyway, um, Charlie, I wanted to point out that <clears throat> this was a very good show. You could have probably divided this up into four different shows. It was that informative. Maybe you will. Maybe we can see it back here one more time. There was a lot of good information there. I wanted to point out about, <clears throat> I, I hope everybody knows that one of these two things, one, corn production, and then two, oil wars. Um, half of our corn goes into gas tanks in this country. So, and the other half goes into feed and other products. But, and then soybeans generally goes to feed for animals. But yeah, half of our, about half of our corn grown in this country goes into gas tanks to be burned for transport fuels. Two, I want to point out oil wars continue and continue ever since, I don't know when they started, but even Palestine and Ukraine are oil wars. If you follow the um, oil and gas pipelines out of Russia and the oil and gas pipelines out of Saudi Arabia, they go right through Palestine and Israel, and they go right from Russia through Ukraine, down to the Mediterranean. So the stupid media that gets stupider and stupider and more corporation, more corporation is, will not admit that these are about oil wars. And they were oil wars when it was Syria, when they were Iraq, when it was Iran, when it was whatever. These are all oil wars, either pipelines or ports or production or what what have you? Oil fields. So burn baby burn, drill baby drill, Trump. All right. I'm gonna go They're next. All They're all oil. I'm gonna They're go all next. All okay. Which is plastic. I didn't even know plastic You know, nobody really thinks of the benefits of glow of this global warming regime. <laughs> You see, the first thing you got to remember is that a shipping channel is going to open up along the Northwest Passage. It'll be ice free six months out of the year, which means a cheaper transport of shipping goods back and forth between continent and continent. Greenland, with some of the shelf removal, will be able to get more of those uh, rare earths for our electric cars that you all want to have so handily go into. Mm -hmm. The other thing is too, is that uh, it'll open up this central 
central Canada for grain production, much more arable land coming down the pipeline. It might mean some of the erosion of our coastal cities, but just imagine what could happen with the real estate values of inland Florida going up a little bit more. You know, we could we could probably make a fortune. You know, and like I said, if you bought land on a San Andreas Fault in California, earthquake comes by, your land production goes way, your uh, land values go way up. I know I'm being a little bit sarcastic here, but <clears throat> How do you solve climate change? How do you solve food production? How do you maintain a well adjusted society? Well, Ernie, the first thing you got to repopulate is people get more affluent, population trends go down. One of the biggest demographic changes in this century is the number of children per woman per birth. And in a lot of cases, it's going down. Why is that? Because kids are a lot more expensive to raise. You're gonna want one or two of them, but you're not gonna have five or six. As you get more prosperous, the CIA says about $8,000 to $10,000 per year. And the increased availability of birth control and education of women, the population tends to stabilize and even goes down. There's the answer to your population control, Ernie. The other thing you got to remember too, is that we're going to need some big time energy to replace oil. Renewables do have a place, they help save energy, they help do it, but for large industrial processes, for large scale recycling, I'm sorry guys, but we're going to need nuclear. And we're going to need a lot oh, of it. And we're going to need we're going to need the small reactors to produce not only electricity but large sources of industrial heat. You can't recycle aluminum without electric power. You can't mine aluminum without electric power. You can't recycle things without large forms of power. Anyway, I've talked about this stuff in the past. You know where I stand on it. Our world's a lot better off because of the applications of free market capitalism over the last 300 years. And if we somehow let the market determine what our next source is going to be, we're going to be much better off. Right, Les. All right. Who's right. next on the rebuttals? All right, Jake, go ahead. All right, Jake, you're on. Jake, you want the rebut? Go ahead. Oh, Jake's hands up, but he's Can not you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Can hear you, Jake. Uh, okay. Yeah, new, uh, nuclear power is not the solution to climate change. It's it's much it's extremely expensive uh, way to generate power, um, and it 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 actually runs it actually runs against the market because of its cost. It's it's not cost effective. The only way. The only way it's commercial that it's commercially viable is that if it's heavily subsidized um, by uh, subsidized by our tax dollars, and it can also fall victim to climate change. In France, they had to close down several nuclear power plants because the water temperature went up too high. They couldn't cool the radioactive waste cooling towers. That's number one. Number two, the other thing I wanted to say about pesticides. Um, I had an uncle once who passed away several years ago. He was 95 years old. He owned a farm, a small farm up in Kenosha County, Wisconsin, and he had apple and pear trees on it, and he came up with a very creative way of controlling pests, which didn't, didn't use pesticides. What he did is he took uh, used plastic bottles, like from Clorox or you know, other big big pop bottles, that kind of thing, cut a hole in the top and put uh, inside the bottle, he put um, uh, syrup or pop or anything sweet, hung it from the tree. The sweet smell would attract the pests and they'd dive into it and that would kill them. So there, there, there are natural ways of killing pests without using pesticides at all. Uh, okay. 
All right, Jake. That's it. Understand, yep. but I still feel you're grossly misinformed about nuclear power. Oh, Who sorry. else has it? Sorry, oh, no. sorry. Dan, I have a question for you. Go ahead, Dan. All right. Uh, what? When are you going to put up your speech from three weeks ago uh, on the internet? I'm going up over the next week and a two week week or so. I'm working on it. I know oh. Lana's been driving me crazy with it, but it will. They will be going up. Every okay. video will be up by the end of the year. Nice. Okay. Very much so. It'll be up by the end of the year or sooner. So people know what we've been doing. Yes, so I know. It's been here. it's been my yeah, own like negligence that they haven't gone up, but that will be soon taken care of. All right. Anybody else? <clears throat> Anybody else has a rebuttal? Kelvin? John? Ernie? Just, just briefly to... Uh... It's very similar to what we said about any thing about population. Um, any brief study uh, of, of, of economics and uh, that is, you'll find that the countries with the lowest population growth are the most consuming and uh, polluting in the world. Uh, the Western countries, we have negative, America has negative population growth. Uh, but if you discount immigration, Britain and, 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 and Europe have negative uh, population growth. If you discount uh, uh, immigration, it's as as the uh, as as a country gets it produces less children, it consumes more goods. Um, it's when you when 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 you can afford to feed all your children and plus, then you get air conditioning, a second car, um, you know, a, a foreign holiday too. Maybe um, it's it's that, that we consume more and we have a ne we have negative uh, population growth. Okay, uh, Dan, you got something else to say? Yeah. As Go far ahead. as po all right, population growth, the economics of it is people have children so they can work for the family and provide economics money for the family to survive. In a rich country like America, you don't need kids yeah. to support you. So... There are not many children. Anyways, soil can be created in one or two or three years, not in one day. You need, uh, soil is so silt, clay, and sand, and organic matter, maybe one to 9%. Then there's air, 25%, and water, 25%. So soil is a lot of things, and you can't just put it together in your kitchen and five minutes later or an hour later have some soil. That's impossible. Soil and also soil has a lot of bacteria, archaea, archaea and protozoa, which interact with the so with the roots of the plant and feed the plant. And the plant feeds the, the bacteria and it's a symbiotic relationship. There are two uh, overarching theories of soil. You can think of it as industrial, technological, or you can think of it as natural, as part of so as part of nature. If you're if you're a technology person, like Charlie, you can just put some bags of fertilizer, bags of nitrogen, bags of phosphorus and throw some fertilizer in there and throw some pesticide on there and you'll be happy. Or you can work with nature and not fight nature. And you can build, you can build the soil by putting clover and hairy vetch and legumes to take the nitrogen out of the air and to create a, a nice atmosphere for the plant to live. As far as big ag, Big Ag invented CAFOs, confined air animal feeding operations, which are criminal. They 80% of antibiotics are used by animals, 20% by people. So when you go to McDonald's, you're eating uh, antibiotics. When you go in the Jewel or whatever store in California, uh, Ralph's or whatever's in Texas, you're, you're eating uh, pesticide, you're eating 
right. antibiotics, right. which don't help the uh, system, which have created um, which have created a, uh, sicknesses like heart disease, uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, and di dementia. I mean, a lot of this wasn't around 70 years ago. And uh, it all started when we started to get cheap food. Cheap food because of cheap, because of uh, benefits for large growers, got soybean and corn um, price supports. So they would have 10,000 acres. They'd get $1,000 an acre if something went wrong. But vegetable and vegetable and fruit growers did not get the benefits. So free cheap food became the thing. And as cheap food, our health costs went up. Health costs doubled in the last 20, 50 years. In the last 50 years, health costs doubled and food came down a hundred percent. So we lost, we spent, we spend money anyways. We're gonna spend it. You either spend it to the farmer or you spend it to your doctor. Actually, I went to uh, a farmer's market today. I paid 40 bucks a pound for some lamb. I got a package about less than a handful. It costs about seven bucks. Anyways, so I mean, or I could pay, I could have a heart attack or a stroke or get dementia, which I have, or get diabetes or high blood pressure. And I could pay some goddamn hospital or some goddamn doctor all the money that I could have spent on food. Um, and let's see what else I got. Tomatoes are not perennials. You got to plant tomatoes every year. And fake meat, they're having major problems with the fake meat creation mm -hmm. because they can't get rid of the waste. When you create, a, when you have a tomato or a cow, or a chicken or a pig, it shits out the waste. But when you create a fake meat, a fake meat in the lab, there's no way to get rid of the waste. So all that, it turns into methane, it turns into bacteria mm -hmm. that eats up the meat and they can't, they can't figure out a way to, to correct it. Their projections for billions of dollars are 10 years behind. Okay, that's all I have. Thank right. you for your attention. All right. Uh, Hi, can you hear me? Can you hear me? You Hello? already been on, Jake. You already were there. I just, I just, I just, I, I just, I just want to say. Oh, okay. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. We, 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 we already spoke, Jake. So I'm going to mute you. Go ahead. All right, Doug. Go ahead. Andy, you're ready to go. Jake, Jake's muted right now. We're going to, you know, if he, he's already had his turn. It's your turn now. No, no, it's your, it's your turn now. Jake's, Jake, Jake already spoke. I'd like to thank Charlie for a, a brilliant presentation. It's one of the best we've seen in the college in years. And what uh, the number one okay there's a website called dissident research uh, dissident um, dissident voice earlier today the number one story on there was the melting ice of Greenland it's called uh, slicing and dicing Greenland the ice uh, Robert Hunziger from DePaul University he wrote it and he said, uh, they've just found out from satellite images, the ice in Greenland is melting 100 times faster than what they thought just two years ago. And they're looking at over the next 10 to 20 years, a, a sea level rise of six to 10 feet. So the debate is raging now, how do you move Manhattan to higher ground or build a moat around it? Uh, both of those things are ridiculous. Um, we, have, uh, we have less than a year Charlie's presentation, everything he talked about will not be possible after next November. 
if the criminals supported by billionaire predators running for office right now are allowed to take control of this country. They have published their plan, the plan next year starting on day one of the new Republican administration, whether it's Trump or one of his toadies, the plan is get rid of all regulation. That means the FDA, the Environmental Protection Agency, all regulations on oil companies and pollution, no regulation. Let, let the billionaires run free. No regulation on drugs, chemicals, and food, none of that. A third thing, uh, all environmental science, the EPA, every, everybody that's studying or trying to do something about global warming, all that science. will be defunded in America. It's to build pipe off the coast, increase drilling on land and sea, just a blueprint for the total destruction of planet Earth. That's the blueprint that will go into effect in this country next November after the election if they're allowed to take control. They, they, they already have a vetting. They're, they have job interviews for 50,000 people to take the place of a current all the um, civil servants that are in the, the EPA and the FDA and the, basically the non-political jobs, they're all going to be replaced with what we call Trump toadies. Like, and also they have a plan. They will be packing the courts. We'll have kangaroo courts all over this country, so you won't be able to sue anybody for wrongful death if you get chemicals in the food to kill you. That's what the future looks like. I thought kangaroos were a big species. Well, they are, but not in the courts. No, they're not. So, uh, you know, Charlie's talk is, um, and, and uh, these other things we'd like to do are very, very much like, uh, to, you know, concentrating, concentrating on uh, revamping your old kitchen while your house is burning down around you. Uh, you don't capture the essence of, pro you know, you have to deal with problem number one first. And problem number one first is the mil U.S. military says climate change is the number one threat to our country now. And incidentally, uh, Tim talked about the waterways opening up. Well, if the waterways open up from the ice melting, where do you think that water is going to go? Sea level rise. So it'll be much easier to ship goods from Europe and everywhere else right through the North Pole, and they can ship those ships right down to where Manhattan used to be because it's underwater now. And also, everybody's ranting and raving about keep our southern border. Got to close the southern border. Well, if Manhattan and other coastal cities go underwater a few feet of six and eight sea level rise, where do you think those people are going to be migrating to? Right here, the largest freshwater source uh, in, in America, right? Yep. You think they're fighting off migrants at the southern border now? Picture what this is going to look like with about 50 million people coming into the Chicago and Illinois, Indiana, the Great Lakes area. This is what our future looks like if we don't deal with climate change. So, as I said before, uh, through this book, Facing the Climate Emergency, how to Transform Yourself with Climate Truth is one of the best small books you can buy. Also, as some of you may have heard of the, the youth movement that was started by Greta Thunberg from Sweden. It's called Fridays for the Future. There's millions, probably tens of millions of students, middle school, high school, out of school every Friday protesting climate change all over the world. And this summer, after Christmas, they're gonna be ramping up the effort. They're gonna be shutting down roads in major cities much we had a taste of that last week when uh, they shut down the Kennedy Expressway with people driving along at 10 miles an hour. That took us an hour longer to get here. Uh, you know, uh, Tim and me last week, there was a, a, a protest about Gaza. But when people, people find out that their future is gone, sold out to the million billionaire predators of the fossil fuel industry, there's going to be more protests. That's, other than just let it happen and accept their like, um, uh, was it uh, McCullough? What was the name of the fellow that gave a speech here uh, six, seven, three, four months ago? A climate scientist. <laughs> I, I forget. <laughs> he said, just 
there really won't be many people living on the planet after 2030. Just enjoy your last few years as a good human being. Well, a lot of people refuse to accept that dim future. We refuse to give up. Okay. And we're facing the reality the best we can heads on. Guy McPherson. Tim, Tim, what? Say again? Somebody ask a question? No, Guy no, McPherson. McPherson. Guy, Guy McPherson. Yeah, that was the name. It okay. just escaped me there for a minute. But anyway, um, Greta Thunberg's book, incidentally, is available in all bookstores. It's called The, the Climate Book. And it's a summary of the best, like about 30, 30 minds of climate scientists, men and women from all over the world, talking about different pieces of the problem, like uh, there's there's natural gas off of Gaza that they're fighting about. Charlie That's President another reason for the war. Here. All right, Dan, let's, 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 let's let it go. Oh, that's a good point. So the, the billionaire predators want to take over the oil fields and gas fields off the coast of Gaza. That's what the, the genocide is all about going on with Israel. That was planned over a year ago. So uh, we can talk about that at another time. But uh, if we don't protest that, then uh, we're giving a, a green stamp for our country just to oppose genocide all over the planet. Anywhere that there are fossil fuel rich reserves that the billionaire predators want. We got a problem with billionaire predators. And we if we don't face that, our country is gone. Thank you. All right, Kelvin, you want to say something and we'll go have to get the uh, Yeah, uh first first question is to Charlie. Um or anybody else can answer the question. What percentage do you think uh America is to the contribution towards greenhouse gases. I know uh, the latest figures I heard uh, for Britain, for the UK, we contribute 2% of uh, greenhouse gases. So, you know, if, Brit if Britain sank into the sea tomorrow, apart from raising the, uh, the, 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 the levels of sea levels, um, it wouldn't really make a significant change to, uh, to, to the climate. Um, and it, I, I'm assuming I'm not you, uh, extrapolating those figures, even with the fact that you guys drive bigger cars, et cetera, et cetera. Let's say uh, America is 15%. Um, the difference that the Western nations can make to climate change is a drop in the ocean compared to India and China and, uh, and Southeast Asia. The, 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 and that is where... The, uh, the the battle will be or, or should be fought, but that's not going to happen. That that simply is not going to happen. You know, there, there are emerging nations, there are developing nations that you, you can't say to them, well, we've got refrigerators, but you can't. Uh, we've got air conditioning, you have, you can't. Um, this is this is not going to happen. I think climate climate change is inevitable because we're not going to solve the problem. Sorry, but we're not. And what you see in politics, et cetera, et cetera, is a fire sale. Give me 30 seconds after him. All right, Chuck. Uh, I got 10, 10, 10 seconds and 30 seconds, and we got to go to Charlie. Go ahead. All right, yeah. I would like to provide a hopeful answer to what our gentleman from England just said. Log on to uh, the website called Rocky Mountain Institute in Colorado. They have a worldwide program showing what's happening in cities all over the world to do something about climate change. Beneficial programs are happening in third world countries, first countries. <laughs> it's happening way faster on a larger scale. You know, we can't just say that will never happen, that will never happen, because good things are happening now. <laughs> and the number one source for that hopeful information is Rocky Mountain Institute. Thank you. Jonathan, 10 seconds, and then Charlie, we got to get you up or close. Thanks again, Chuck, for a great presentation. Uh, this was a great night to see you here in person, uh, up close and personal. Some documentary films that might interest people about this topic, uh, Food, Inc. I'm sure we've discussed that film before here at the college. Uh, a newer one by Michael Moore called Planet of the Humans, and also a classic by Naomi Klein, this changes everything. Uh, those three documentary films are really great on this specific topic. Thank you. All right, uh, Charlie, if you're ready to rebut, yeah, for All final right. remarks. Thank you very much. Again, thank you very much. 
for coming out tonight. Let's see what I'll talk about. Um, Ernie, the U.S. government owns enormous amount of land. A lot, much of that land can be transformed uh, through the processes that I've outlined here tonight. And we don't even need to acquire land, the Bureau of Land Management, all they could ready to go and go out there in a day, you could have cultivable land, land ready for cultivation. You come out there, my boys will take care of my crew. We'll make that land ready for cultivation and the farm boys can be right behind just planting crops to get and taking it food for the people. Uh, number two, uh, there's not too many people in the world. There's too many rich people. No, there's not enough. If there's too many rich people. I think in this, in keeping with the holiday spirit, we should take from the rich and give to the poor. Amen. And then there's plenty enough people. Say that so again. there's too many poor people, too many rich people. That's what I say. Uh, regarding soil, um, for any number of years, Dan, I had put together my secret formula for soil. I at one time had anywhere from 100 to 200 potted plants in my house. Um, my windows were, and I had Rolex lamps as well. Um, this stuff works. It doesn't take forever. Um, that's, there's no reason you can't use it. And it does work. My tenant asked me, said if you, if you could plant some tomatoes in the yard. And I said, sure, it's just fine. Soil's all ready to go. And then he came back to me, gave me a sack of tomatoes. He said, I never seen tomato plants grow like this in my life. It's unbelievable. He said, I don't know what to do with them all. He said, what kind of soil is What kind of... But I mean, yeah, it's ready to go. All the basic elements of cultivation, ready for cultivation, are there. I don't know. What, what do you think? It has to age like wine or something? I mean, there's microorganisms are there. It's a growing medium. Uh, you know, it's ready to go. It, that's what I mean. Now, uh, let's see, the last thing is, um, yeah, it's the holiday season. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. And I, I, I'm sorry, I, I saw Santa, and he reported to me that, unfortunately, a lot of you guys and gals haven't been too good this year. And what he says, each of you is going to get enough coal to heat your house all winter. Fossil fuel. Anyhow, thank you now for coming, and I hope you enjoyed it. Again, the PowerPoint slides are listed in several locations on the website of the College of Complexes. Have a nice holiday, everyone, and we'll see you in two or three weeks. All thank right, you. Dismiss us and adjourn to college, Charlie. All right. Let's